A natural question that comes up now is how should we write our program in order to minimize the effect of such approximations or is there any way to avoid this? Well, the general sweeping answer is no. You can never completely avoid this because when you are doing the mathematics, you are using infinitely many numbers and the computer is using only finitely many numbers. Unless you know that you are doing something which also is confined within those finitely many numbers like you are using only integers and your program is dealing only with integers like you are finding a shape of two numbers. If you know that your computation is already confined within that finite subset then you are safe but otherwise you are bound to spill out of the range of numbers that may be exactly represented in the computer. So, there is no universal guarantee to save you. However, if you are careful, you can actually avoid some serious pitfalls. And I am going to give you one such pitfall. A very, a very simple example where you have heavy loss of significant digits. Something that you can often avoid. Suppose you are trying to add or subtract two numbers that are widely differing in magnitude. Say you are trying to add 0 0.00000123 with the number 456. So 456 is one number, a huge number, and the other number is small 0.00000123. Let's pretend that I am using a floating point system which has only five digits for the mantissa. So it can store only five most significant digits. Now when you add them, the result is 456.0000123. So now you have got significant digits starting with that 4 and ending with that 3 of 1 to 3. You have lots of significant digits. But you can store only the five most significant of them. So it will store 4, 5, 6, 0, 0, all the other significant digits, those 1, 2, 3 are coming far towards the right end and as a result, you will not store them at all. So what will be the answer? If you add 4, 5, 6 plus 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, you will get the answer 456. That part, that extra thing that you added is completely wiped out. This is loss of significant digits. So if you are adding a very small number, small absolute value number to a large number, then the small number might just get washed out. Always avoid adding small numbers to large numbers. And this also shows another very dangerous thing that this addition is not even associated because of the simple reason Suppose you have got many of these small numbers, many numbers like 0 0.000123, but you have 1 billion of them. You add them first. In that case, they now become a sizable number. Now you add them to 456, you will have some effect because the first 5 significant digits will now change. On the other hand, if you start with 456 and add all those 0 0.000123 one at a time, each one of them will attack that big number and will get lost because the significant digits are lost. So at every step 456 will continue to remain 456 and at the end of adding that enormous list it will still have 456 as before. So the order in which you are adding them that changes the answer. So the addition of floating point numbers is actually not even associated. That was an example where you got into trouble because of loss of significant digits. Now here is another example where you will get a similar problem because of introduction of trash digits. Suppose you are subtracting one number from another. Say I am trying to subtract 123.569 from another number which is also 
Now in this case, say I have uh, six digits for the mantissa, so I can store both these numbers exactly. However, as I have already told you, not all significant digits are really good digits, many of them are trash digits. Suppose in this case, the parts before the decimal points, they are the good digits, things that I really am sure about. And the remaining things are just trash digits. They are result of some other computation that I am not quite sure about. In the same way that I said, I have measured some length up to the nearest millimeter, then I have halved it. That does not mean that I am now sure about the result up to the nearest half millimeter. So, I really cannot say that the, the point, that the digits after the decimal point are really of an importance. They are trash digits. Now when you subtract one from the other, what happens? What happens is that these important things, the 1, 2, 3 part, they are just knocked off and you get only the trash digits. So the answer that you get is basically nothing but trash digits. It is full of trash. And this happens all the time whenever you are trying to subtract one number from another number which is very close. So in the last example, we talked about adding one number to another number where the absolute values are far apart. And here it is just the opposite thing. You are trying to subtract a number from another number which is very close. And this tremendously increases the number of trash digits. The significant part gets cancelled off. What remains is mostly consisting of trash digits. Let us see one example of this in practice. And I will also tell you how to avoid it for that particular example. So this example is taken from our very familiar formula for solving a quadratic equation that b square minus 4 is the formula. Suppose I have a quadratic equation with these values for my a, b and c. a equal to 3, b equal to 10 to the power 9 and c equal to 100. So notice that b is enormously higher than the other two. Now I need to do this quadratic thing so I will have this function qd which will compute the quadratic for me and then I will need a formula, a function to compute the root so I will be using the function this function minus b plus square root of b square minus 4ac divided by twice a. So I am using only this particular root. So I have, this is basically a subtraction. This is plus and this is minus and these quantities are all non-negative. So let us see what is the result that we are getting. So I will try to evaluate the quadratic at the root. So though I have called r a function, r is actually just a constant. I could have, I do not know why I wrote it as a function. I could have just written it as a, as a number. So when I evaluate the quadratic at r, I should get 0. And I get something which is quite far from 0. 0 0.6589, etc. <coughs> we have seen non-zero numbers in place of zero numbers, but they were of the order of 10 to the power minus 13, 10 to the power minus 10, something like that. This is pretty high. And the main problem that occurred here is because when I computed that minus b, that was a huge thing, minus 1 into 10 to the power 9. And when I computed that square root of this, this quantity, this b square was pretty huge and 4ac compared to that was very little. So it hardly influenced the significant part. So it was basically b with all the trailing significant digits were just trash. <coughs> so if I print it, it seems that it is actually again 1 times 10 to the power 9. So all the things that really changed are in the far end. You hardly feel the presence. Now when I subtract one from the other, what do I get? I should ideally get zero. But remember, these numbers do have some trash digits and only the trash part shows up. So when I do this, minus b plus square root of 
this quantity, so I will just write it, this minus b, I get this number which is basically consisting of all the trash digits because the only part that I could be sure about they are knocked off because square root of b square minus 4ac and b are pretty close together. So I am basically looking at some trash digits. So my root is composed of only some trash digits and as a result I can see that the root is very much inaccurate. Now one way to tackle this problem in this example is this. We just rewrite this quantity. So this is the quantity that we are trying to compute. This is the root. What I do is I multiply and divide it with this number. Just its conjugate so to speak. The conjugate salt. So I take this and I multiply the numerator and the denominator with this thing. Now I can apply the standard a square minus b square formula. So I get this and <clears throat> the denominator is this thing. Here I will have a, I will have a cancellation. So I had a problem because these two numbers were very close together in absolute value and I was trying to form the difference. I have the same situation here. This number and this number are very close together and I am trying to form the difference. However, in this case I can do this analytically and they just nicely knock off each other and it becomes 4ac which cancels partly with this 2a giving me this minus 2c by this. So theoretically this quantity and this quantity are just the same but when we want to compute it using a computer this is much more precise. Okay, so let's see how this technique that we have learned, this little manipulation, algebraic manipulation helps us in practice. So I still work with same a equal to 3, b equal to 10 to the power 9 and c equal to 10, oh, sorry c equal to 100 and I have my same qd function, qd. I had earlier the function R1, I have made it into a variable now, R1 is this and we saw that QD of R1 turns out to be quite far from 0. Now I will use that other expression, I will call it R2 which is minus twice C divided by P plus square root of B square minus 4AC and let me just see what is the value of R1, this is R1 and this is R2, they are not too far when you are printing them like this, but let's try the value of the quadratic at R2 and you get 0 this time. So just by manipulating the expression slightly, you arrive at a different form which is algebraically equivalent but numerically quite different. Thus, we got two guidelines about how we should compute. Namely, we should always avoid adding two numbers when they are of widely differing absolute values. And number two, we should avoid computing the difference of two numbers that are very close together. Now, we can have similar guidelines about multiplication and division as well. For example, when you multiply, try to avoid multiplication by huge numbers. The reason is very simple. Suppose you have a number which is reasonably small and just got some amount of error in it. Now you multiply it with a huge number. As a result, this error also gets magnified. So multiplication by large numbers is a dangerous operation. Unless you know that the number that you are multiplying happens to be exact. Similarly, for division, you should be careful about dividing by very small numbers. Very small means numbers that are very small in absolute value, very close to zero. Because when you are dividing by a very small number, that is effectively multiplying by its reciprocal, which is a very large number. We have given some guidelines for safeguarding against numerical inaccuracy 
for the simple arithmetic operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication and division. It may not be that easy to come up with similar guidelines in case of more complicated operations, for example, matrix inversion. It so happens that for matrix inversion, we do have a good guideline. It is called the condition number of a matrix. Suppose I have a non-singular matrix A, then I define the condition number of A as square root of maximum absolute eigenvalue of A transpose A divided by minimum absolute eigenvalue of A transpose A. Since I am working with a non-singular matrix, the denominator can never vanish. So that's the number. Now the heuristic guideline is this, that if the condition number is large, then you might land yourself into trouble. But if the condition number is small, then that is a safe case. So, large condition number does not necessarily mean that you will be in trouble, but small condition number means that there will not be any trouble. In particular, if you are working with orthogonal matrices, then the condition number has to be 1, because A transpose A is just the identity matrix, so both the numerator and the denominator are just equal to 1. <coughs> And in fact, though I have written maximum absolute eigenvalue, I really do not need that absolute term because it is A transpose A, which is a positive definite matrix. So these will always be positive numbers. <coughs> so I really do not need the absolute thing. After all the discussion about floating point numbers and the inaccuracies involved with them, you might be very much annoyed with all floating point computations. You might think that. Whenever I do anything in a computer, it is approximate and I really do not know how good it is, etc. There is a way out. The way out is not to use floating point numbers at all. You can always use integers, which is a special type of fixed point representation where there are no digits after the point, decimal point or binary point. Integers have the great advantage that it is very easy to understand which numbers have got exact representation. The only way you can have a problem is when you run into fractions or when you have a very high integer larger than what you can store or a very high integer in the negative end. Other than that, everything is exact. So it is effectively closed under addition, subtraction and multiplication. Only if you are not overflowing and you can very easily keep a guard against whether you are overflowing or not. So if you are careful, you will never run into a wrong answer without knowing beforehand that you are going to overflow. A little trouble is with division, but there also you can first check divisibility and only then proceed. As a result, many people prefer to use a computer only in terms of integers. They will map everything into integers. Even if they are working with fractions like one third, they will not consider this as one divided by three, but as a tuple, one comma three. And whenever they will do any computations, they will work with the numerator and denominator separately. This is used wherever you need high precision. For example, when you are watching this video, even the aspect ratio of this video, which is a typically a high precision thing, is not given simply as a fraction, uh, I mean not given simply as a decimal number, but as two integers. The numerator integer will possibly give you the width of the screen and then the height will be given by the denominator integer. So two integers are specified. Similarly, the frame rate of a video how many frames per second, that is also usually specified as rationals, as two integers, not as a fractional point. Because these things will be, so, so if there is a slight error in this uh, frame rate, then this is going to accumulate over time and you will lose synchronization with other things like with the audio or with some subtitle. Now, in order to map everything, to integer, you need some specialized techniques. The simplest, as I already said, is for rational numbers, where you store a rational number as a structure with two integers, 
one story in the numerator, the other story in the denominator. If you are trying to work with things like square root of 2, say, in that case, you basically represent that square root as radical by 2, that is the second root of the number 2. Similarly, the cube root of 5 will be stored as the pair 3, 5. And then you have to write your functions in order to deal with such number representations. All these things together, where you are never going into floating point computations, but mapping everything to integers, manipulating the integers in your predefined way, and then finally writing the exact answer that is called symbolic computation. Many modern software support symbolic computation. For example, if you are using Python, then SymPy will do symbolic computation while NumPy will perform numeric computations. R has very primitive support for some symbolic differentiation. J has a lot of support for symbolic computation. It can, by default, out of the box, work with rational numbers. So, before you get completely fed up with computers because it introduces approximations, you, you now know that there is another way out. And also, when you are using numerical analysis methods, nothing prevents you from using the symbolic computation. So, it is not that I have to either use the numerical computation or I have to use the symbolic computation. You can always mix them. For example, you might use the Gauss-Jordan elimination algorithm, but where all the numbers are represented symbolically. I will give you one example where I shall compute the inverse of the Hilbert matrix where each number, each entry in the matrix, which is rational, will be stored as a tuple, a pair of two integers, numerator and denominator. Then I will use the very standard Gauss-Jordan elimination and get just the exact answer. I will be using the language J for that purpose. Okay, so we are going to use the language J for this purpose. Now, if you hate J or if you do not know J, then it will be difficult for you to follow this. But basically, this is what we are going to do. We are going to create the um, Hilbert matrix, but in a symbolic way. So, I will be rep representing every entry of the Hilbert matrix using a fraction, numerator by denominator form. Now, I will first show how J does that. So, I can write 1 R3 in J and that denotes the number one third. In order to say this, suppose I write 1 R3 and with this I, I add 2 R5. So, one third plus two fifth and it really performs the addition symbolically and gives me the answer 11 R15, that is 11 by 15. So, the number 1 R3 is a single number which consists of two integer parts. So, things are stored exactly. Now, let me construct the Hilbert matrix. I will do it step by step. I will first create that list of all integers from 1 to 10. I will call it I or maybe I will call it TMP for temp. <coughs> this equal to colon is the assignment operator. So, TMP. And then I will write i dot 10. Now if I do i dot 10, it will give me a list from 0 to 9. J like C starts counting from 0. So I will need to add a 1 plus to it. 1 plus this. Let's quickly see what TMP is. It is indeed 1, 2, 3, 4 up to 10. Now I will need to create that um, addition table. The table which is a 10 by 10 matrix where the ij is entry is the number i plus j or then I will make it the reciprocal so I will first work with i plus j. To make such a matrix I can use the function which is addition so it is plus whenever I want to make a table I can write a slash after that. So tmp plus slash tmp will give me a 10 by 10 matrix which is basically the addition table. So it is, you can see that the ij entry here it is 
the third row and fourth column entry is 3 plus 4. This is 10 plus 10 is 20. Of course, I need the reciprocal. So far, there is no approximation, exact integers. Now, I need to do the reciprocals. If I do it in the usual way of 1 divided by this, then that will give me the usual horrendous stuff with all those oops. I got uh, error because here the operation is not pi. You have to write percentage to denote division. And I get all those uh, perfection, decimal, blah, blah, blah. And these are all inaccurate. So we do not want that. I want to do it in the exact way. So I will write this one as one or one. So this tells J to do everything in precise symbolic computation. Just by writing one as one R1 is a hint to J you work with symbolic computations. <clears throat> so once I do that, I get lots of rational numbers. All these numbers are exact. For example, what I have here in the uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 6. 7, 6th entry is 1 divided by 13. That is indeed 1 divided by 6 plus 7. So things are precise. Okay, let me store this in the matrix which I will call H. H. So I have the matrix H. That's my Hilbert matrix. Now I shall employ again the same familiar Gauss-Jordan elimination to this. And for that, the routine is percent dot is the abbreviated name for Gauss-Jordan elimination in J. So I will write this. Hit enter. Woo! I get lots of integers. So that's a surprising fact that the exact inverse of the Hilbert's matrix consists of only integers. So it is perfectly possible to store the inverse of H in the computer. There is no inaccuracy there. Only the intermediate steps go into all those problems. Now let's just see whether this is really H inverse or still an approximation. I will give it a name H in. And I will compute the <coughs> matrix product. So H MP will compute the matrix product for me. H times H in. And I get the exact identity matrix. No inaccuracy anywhere because we can find ourselves to symbolic computation.